from uh, the University of Boston. We have uh, Dr. Manju Subramaniam, who will be giving us a keynote address, and she's going to talk about eye to brain, the eye-based protein biomarkers for the Alzheimer's disease. Okay, thank you for having me today. It's an honor to be here. I have no relevant financial interest to disclose um, related to this talk. My research uh, in this presentation is supported in part by donations from one of my patients, James Hamlet, and also in part by an NIH grant uh, by the National Institute of Aging. We have a, how do I forward the uh, slides? Excellent. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Alzheimer's disease. It's a chronic progressive neurodegenerative disease leading to severe cognitive dysfunction and eventual death. It's the most common form of dementia affecting memory, communication, ability to focus, reasoning and judgment, visual perception. Alzheimer's disease comprises about 60 to 70 percent of all cases of dementia worldwide, and in 2010, there were 35.6 million people affected worldwide. And it's anticipated that by 2050, 115 million people will be affected. The average survival from diagnosis to death is about four and a half years. Alzheimer's is a clinical diagnosis that's confirmed only post-mortem on neuropathological examination. The treatment challenges are that because the symptoms and diagnosis occurs in the later phases of the disease, it is often too late by then for any current therapies to have any meaningful effect. So there is a pressing need for sensitive and specific diagnostic tests that can diagnose um, Alzheimer's disease. Should I hold? Should I press again? Sorry. So because Alzheimer's disease is diagnosed in the late stages of the disease, there's a need for sensitive and specific diagnostic tests. And this is really the holy grail of Alzheimer's treatment. So I'm not going to talk necessarily about research strategies in this talk. I'm going to talk more about, um, you know, our methodology in looking for biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease. So um, pathologically speaking, Alzheimer's disease um, occurs because of amyloid plaques in the brain and neurofibrillary tangles. The amyloid plaques release A beta and the neurofibrillary tangles release the protein tau. And these biomarkers are in the cerebrospinal fluid and they're often used to confirm the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. So what does this have to do with us? Well, eye disease and Alzheimer's disease, some people feel, are very much related. The eye is like a window to the brain. AV. Am I pushing the button? Is that what's happening? Okay. Because the eye is like a window to the brain, they share a common neuroectodermal origin. Patients with eye disease are considered to be an at-risk population for Alzheimer's disease. They've developed a lot of correlation studies have shown that there are similarities in um, glaucoma and Alzheimer's disease. There have been correlations that have been made between macular degeneration and Alzheimer's disease. So because there's a need for identification of Alzheimer's disease in its early stages, they, there are some people that think that the eye may hold the key. So most of the studies that are looking at ocular biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease have really focused on imaging biomarkers obtained by either a dynamic vessel analyzer or the optical coherence tomography.
So really, I'm, I'm talking about, if I scan, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. So um, you want the previous slide? Oh, okay. So, um, yeah, so to answer your question, we're looking at um, different types of, oh, okay, I'll carry on. Okay. So most of the research um, done on looking at eye-based biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease is really focusing on imaging research, specifically by the dynamic vessel analyzer and by optical coherence tomography and optical coherence tomography angiography. What I've been studying is looking at eye-based protein biomarkers, A beta and tau protein, and I'll go into that um, in a little bit more detail. So really quick, I don't know a whole lot about the technology, about the dynamic vessel analyzer, but in theory, it's looking at vessel diameter. And this basically describes the top analyzer is a healthy control, and the bottom one is someone with Alzheimer's disease. And it shows that there are retinal vessel changes in response to diffuse luminar flicker. And they, in patients with Alzheimer's disease, they tend to have reduced arteriolar dilation and decreased reaction amplitude. So that's the dynamic vessel analyzer. On optical coherence tomography, in those with Alzheimer's disease, you can see thinning of the nerve fiber layer, reduced macular volume, and a thinning of the choroidal layer of the eye. On OCTA, the studies that have been done are small still, and it's still very much in its early phases, but there have been descriptions of changes to the ofovulae vascular zone and the superficial and deep capillary plexus in those with Alzheimer's disease and even preclinical Alzheimer's. So if you look here at uh, OCTA findings, you can see the difference between Alzheimer's disease, glaucoma, and healthy controls. In the top row of photographs, that is the superficial capillary plexus, and you can see that between, um, in the superficial capillary plexus, both Alzheimer's disease and glaucoma shows some um, decrease in the perfusion, right, compared to the healthy controls. But if you look at the deep capillary plexus, those changes are more specific to Alzheimer's disease. You can see there's reduced flow um, in those with Alzheimer's disease compared to glaucoma and the healthy controls. And then here's an, a photograph of some studies showing that there's an enlarged foveolae vascular zone in those with Alzheimer's, but these have been conflicting. There have been other studies that have shown that there's no effect on the foveolae vascular zone. So this is another photograph of, um, by the uh, Sharon Fekrotz group in, at Duke University, and you can see those with Alzheimer's disease on the top row um, have reduced perfusion in uh, vascular density and perfusion density compared to Parkinson's, mild cognitive impairment, and H-match controls on the bottom row. So the advantages of OCTA testing is that it's non-invasive and low cost, but the disadvantage is that the findings that you see on OCTA can be confounded by common eye diseases like glaucoma and diabetic retinopathy. So what we've proposed is to look at other biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease, specifically protein biomarkers, and that's what our study did. Um, and the advantage of doing that is that eye disease patients we know are now an at-risk population for Alzheimer's disease. It could potentially be a more specific test. It's less invasive than a lumbar puncture, but certainly more invasive. Um, this is one of the disadvantages. It's more invasive than um, OCTA testing and also, um, um, and it's also not very well studied. So we embarked on the vitreous biomarker study and what we did on that study was to determine if known biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease um, exist in the vitreous humor and if it could correlate with cognitive function. We looked specifically at A beta 40, 42, phosphorylated tau and total tau. We did vitrectomies on 80 eyes of 80 patients for various eye conditions. We obtained mini mental status examination on them. We looked at the clinical and education history and their demographic information. And during surgery, we obtained about 0.5 to 2 milliliters of undiluted vitreous. And these samples were analyzed by ELISA. And what we found was that the um, levels of A beta and total tau were significantly associated with their cognitive scores. So patients who had lower cognitive scores or lower MMSE scores had lower levels of A beta and lower levels of total tau. And this is very consistent with what's seen in the CSF for A beta. So the cerebral spinal fluid will show lower levels of A beta um, in uh, connection with lower cognitive levels. But what we found was also opposite for total tau, what we found was opposite to what's seen in cerebral spinal fluid. We don't know why that is, um, why tau is opposite to what's seen in cerebral spinal fluid and why um, A beta and
and A beta 40 and A beta 42 is similar in the vitreous to what's seen in cerebral spinal fluid. But we did publish these findings in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease. And here is in a table format our findings. You can see the p-values at the end. There's a significant correlation between A beta 40, 42, and total tau compared to MMSE scores, but not for phosphorylated tau. So the implications of our study is that we have, um, we have confirmed that Alzheimer's disease biomarkers exist in the vitreous humor, and we've confirmed that we've established a relationship to these biomarkers to cognitive scores, and this has helped to confirm the eye has a very strong relationship to the brain. It also indicates that protein biomarkers in the vitreous may play a potential role as an early diagnostic marker, but more studies need to be done. And so this is my study team. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. You're welcome. Uh, actually, uh, yeah. Yes, because they were undergoing vitrectomy for retinal detachments, for diabetic retinopathy, for other conditions. So all that we asked them to do was to donate their vitreous because we normally discard it. They were having yeah. other problems, yes. No. Yeah, that was, that was what crossed my mind. And then she's answered it in the presentation <laughs> for other conditions, the yeah. comorbidities. Yeah. And oh, yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. the articulation. Uh, and the study had institutional review board approval and patients filled out consent forms. And the other thing is that uh, the OCT that uh, she's, she's showing is the swept source OCT, the NFAS, which is not really available to the, to the clinicians. It's available only to the research centers. That's exactly right. So, so yeah. those, those, um, those photographs were beautiful photographs, but not available to everyone at this time. Let's hope we'll, we'll get them in a few years. Yeah. So even, even most Thank places you so in the U.S. don't have access to that technology. I got all those from the journals. Uh, right. Can I have a question here? Yeah. Uh, that was a very nice presentation, and it opens up our eyes to even you know, assessing the eye for other conditions. But uh, just an extension to the question that was just asked, that the other pre conditions which were already existing, the retinal diseases, uh, they did not have any impact on the biomarkers which you were assessing in the vitreous? That's a really great question because that is always a question that particular reviewers have. No, we did a regression analysis and we found that there was no correlation to eye disease uh, right. for any of them. So the, the data was uh, corrected and controlled for age, sex, education, and eye disease. Are there any specific retinal diseases which you wanted to exclude something like an AMD? In these patients? We didn't. So our patient population at Boston Medical Center is very international and very diverse. We don't see a lot of AMD. There were only a few of those patients that had AMD in our study. So we don't think that had any impact on the finding. But you didn't exclude and them. We, and we did not exclude them. But we did control for them in, in regression analysis. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, and now it gives me great pleasure to uh, present So, so, if you could use the mic, sir. So, could you please use the mic? I think it's a, that's a nice question. <laughs> Hello. Hey. Ma'am, you have such a beautiful center, and Indian doctors uh, are not having access to this thing, and they are good trained. Access to what? What don't uh, Indian doctors have access trained? to? How are you trained? That can Indian doctors access as a fellow or in some other designation under you? I'm sure she, they, they, they'd love to have multicentric studies. Sir. Yeah. The no, but then, but then, uh, like uh, getting the patients, they would get the patients only in their centers. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't follow the question. Uh, well, he wants to know: Is it possible uh, for any of the Indians to have some openings in this particular area of uh, work? Because we have uh, the talent pool, we have the human resource, yeah. and uh, uh, you have the facilities. <laughs> Let me put it we that do, way. Well, you know, I kind of abridging the gap, whatever the gap here is. Yeah. So, so the, if you look at the, at the paper that we wrote, you know, it's a methodology. We described the methodology so you should be able to replicate the methodology, so that's, that's one. Secondly, um, you know, what we did was we just, we just took the vitreous from patients during the normal course of clinical care. 
the main resource that I needed that I did not have was expertise in biomarker analysis. And so I developed collaborations with, the neuro, um, with our Department of Neuropathology, as well as our, um, um, some experts in clinical biomarker analysis in pharmacy and therapeutics. That being said, there's no reason why um, collaborations can't be developed where we can get specimens um, from, um, for example, if we were to do a multi-center you know, center study or an international collaboration, there's no reason why that can't be done because we also send some of our um, vitreous specimens to Sweden to get them analyzed for neurofilament light chain because that's where the expertise was. Yes, already open, but what I was thinking like, mm -hmm. like we cannot have that OCT. So I think you know, right, so you know, I didn't do OCT uh, on it, my it'll patients. be much, it'll be much better to offer a, a, a good Darjeeling cup of tea, <laughs> and then you know, <laughs> apply so with those questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a nice question, and now it gives me, uh, ma'am. Thank you so much. Many names. I. So I, I want to be clear that that was not my so, study. So what she, was, you know what I she's done? You know what she's done? She has taken the data in totality. And then what she does is she looks at, a, she says that this thing happens, these changes are happening randomly. And she's controlling them statistically. So when she's using a, a, a regression analysis there, it allows her to look for uh, what we call uh, the residuals. So after, after comparing, after controlling for it, we look for the residuals. If the residuals are well scattered, that means we've actually, uh, we should, we are, we are reasonably clear that, you know, it is scattered out data. So, but, but to answer it's question, not, it's not possible to do it uh, like ethically otherwise. Yeah, but to answer your question, we actually did not obtain OCTAs on our patients. I was presenting OCTA data from other institutions in the US just to show what's out there in the literature in terms of biomarkers being used to test for Alzheimer's disease. So right now, most of the research is being done on OCTA as biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease, but I'm doing something slightly different. I'm looking at proteins in the eye. And so right. that's what I was. Thank you so much. Thank Sorry, you. Uh, and now it gives me great.